and this recording will discuss the female internal anatomy. First we have ovaries. Um, they are paired female gonads similar to the testicles in males. These are found on the lateral walls in the pelvic cavity and the ovaries themselves are suspended by ligaments to hold them in place. Their responsibilities include producing secondary oocytes, which then can go on to become fertilized and develop into a fetus. And they also secrete hormones, including estrogen and progesterone. If you are an egg, you would leave the ovaries and enter into the uterine tubes. Um, a lot of people call these the fallopian tubes. Some people refer to them as the oviducts. It's all the same thing. Um, they extend medially from the ovary to the superior and lateral regions of the uterus. And that kind of sounds like a long way to go, but it's actually only about four inches. The uterine tubes are responsible for receiving the oocyte that has been ovulated. And the little oocyte will continue to the uterus via peristalsis as well as cilia. Okay, so the cilia will beat and create waves and it kind of just pushes the oocyte along towards the uterus. The uterine tubes can be divided into a couple of different regions. Um, the infundibulum is the funnel shaped opening at the distal end. Um, we have finger like projections, these are called fimbriae that come from the infundibulum and they kind of drape over the ovaries. It's kind of like the fingers are holding on to the ovaries themselves. Um, once we move through the infundibulum, we would move through the ampulla, which is usually the site of fertilization. We would then move to the isthmus, which connects to the uterus. So obviously our next um, place to travel would be the uterus itself. So speaking of the uterus, or if you like the term womb, it is a pear-shaped hollow organ. It sits anterior to the rectum, but posterior to the urinary bladder, so kind of in the middle within the pelvic cavity. Um, the job of the uterus is to receive, retain, and nourish a fertilized egg. That fertilized egg thing can then grow and develop into an embryo, and again continue to grow and develop into a fetus. This takes approximately 40 weeks, or about 10 months, to grow a fully developed um, fetus that's ready for delivery. Now, if you have never been pregnant and have a uterus, um, your uterus is also about the size of a pear. If you have a uterus and it has been pregnant, um, yours might be a little bit bigger, and that's okay too. Now, the uterus does have three distinct layers. We've got an endometrium, a myometrium, and a perimetrium, or if you like epimetrium, that's okay too. And we've got three distinct regions as well, the fundus, the body, and the cervix. So let's go through these things one at a time. The layers, we're going to do those first. Outermost layer is that parametrium. This is a serous layer because it is an extension of the visceral peritoneum. This helps hold the uterus in place. Okay. Middle layer is the myometrium. You know myo means muscle. Okay, so we've got bundles of smooth muscle. These are going to contract rhythmically during orgasm, menstrual cramps, and childbirth. You already know that smooth muscles are involuntarily controlled, so we cannot consciously control the myometrium. And then the innermost region, the uh, endometrium. This is a highly vascularized mucosal layer. Okay. This lines the uterine cavity, and this is where implantation is supposed to occur of the fertilized egg. We have two sublayers that compose the endometrium. We've got the stratum functionalis and the stratum basalis. The functionalis is the layer that shed each month during menstruation. The basalis is a deeper layer that produces a new functionalis each month. So if you can think way back to the discussion on skin, we had the stratum basal layer, which was the bottom layer of the epidermis. That was where the new cells were growing and everybody would kind of get pushed up. Um, it's kind of the same idea here. You're going to grow the new cells in the basal layer and they kind of push outwards and they create the functionalis, which gets shed each month and you just kind of continue that cycle. 
Now the three regions, the fundus would be the top dome-shaped part. That is where the fallopian tubes enter, so that's where the egg would come in from. The body is the major region of the uterus itself. It tapers down centrally to narrow into the cervix, which protrudes into the vagina. Now the cervical canal communicates with the vagina via the external os. Okay. We've got cervical mucosa cells that secrete thick mucus um, at the cervical region. This is for blocking entry of sperm into the uterus every time except during ovulation. Okay, so during ovulation, the mucus thins out to allow sperm to pass through into the uterus on their way to the fallopian tubes for fertilization. If you have ever had a pap smear, um, and if you've never had a pap smear, uh, they just take this little stick and they scrape off some cervical cells so they can stick them under a microscope and make sure everything is good to go, but this is how you um, detect cervical cancer or not. Alright, so that was a lot of words. Let's look at some pictures here. We've got our ovaries. On each side, you can see the little fimbriae, little fingers wrapping around each ovary. So if we're an egg, we're going to go from the ovary, we're going to go past the fimbriae. The infundibulum was the little, um, the funnel shaped part. We wrap around the ampulla, which is usually where we do implantation. And then we've got the isthmus at the end, which connects to the uterus. Okay. Now, the uterus, we said the top dome part was the, um, the fundus, the body is the thicker part, and then the cervix is the tapered end, which leads to the vagina. And it's a little hard to see here for the different colors, but the thin little layer in, in the innermost one is the endometrium. The myometrium is quite a thick layer, that smooth muscle, and then the parametrium, or the epimetrium on the outside is continuous with this big white sheet, which would be, um, you've got the broad ligament, you've got other ligaments that hold everybody in place, but this is um, serous membrane. Okay, so if you take that little egg that has not been fertilized, we've gone from the uterus, we're going to go down into the vagina. This is very thick walled, but it's only about three to four inches of tube that extends from the cervix to the exterior environment. It also sits between the bladder and the rectum. This is the receptacle for the penis during intercourse, uh, serves as the birth canal during childbirth, and is the passageway for menstrual blood. Um, if no fertilized egg is present. We've got a couple of different uh, regions and layers going on here. We've got the uh, vaginal fornix. Okay. This is a little recess where the superior end of the vaginal canal surrounds the external os. Okay. Um, you've got anterior and posterior fornix, kind of goes all the way around. This is really an indentation that allows for the use of contraceptive, like the diaphragm, okay? Um, so let's go back to our picture. Here we go. So this region is the fornix, okay? And the diaphragm, if you chose to use one, would basically just cover that. So it would cover the, um, the entryway into the uterus preventing uh, fertilization. Then we have uh, the muscularis of the vagina, which is the smooth muscle within the vaginal walls. This um, helps stretch the, the tube that is the vagina during intercourse as well as childbirth. And then the very um, end, or the bottom, I guess you could say, the vaginal orifice. This is the opening of the vagina. This sits posteriorly to the urethral orifice. Initially, it's partially enclosed by the hymen, which is the vascular membrane. Eventually, this, uh -oh, 
eventually that would be ruptured, uh, would cause a little bit of bleeding. This could occur during the first sexual intercourse experience, but it could even occur during strenuous activity, some sort of trauma, things like that. Um, so there's lots of different ways that that membrane can be ruptured.